Well, good evening, everyone, and, and welcome. We're glad that, that you're here, that you uh, chose to be with us tonight. If you're visiting, we are certainly, as always, glad that you're here, and we hope uh, to make you feel welcome. We hope that you uh, stay for a few moments after services, that we can uh, get to know you and greet you uh, a little more completely. Also, if you're visiting, you'll notice on the seat back in front of you some visitor's cards, and if you'll uh, take a moment and fill those out and pass those toward the inside aisles, the ushers will be by in just a few moments to pick those up. Our next time of service will be uh, Wednesday evening for midweek Bible study, and that's at 7 o'clock, and we, we hope that you choose to be with us. Don't forget to pick up a, a, a prayer list uh, outside the uh, doors on the table in the in the foyer there to use as a reminder and a contact sheet for the coming week and they'll they also have the uh, the updates for uh, anything that's in the bulletin a correction uh, on the spelling that's in the bulletin uh, I have announced it incorrectly twice now and my apologies uh, the bridal shower next Sunday from 2 to 4 for Holly Robinson and Brian Pendergraft I have said in the bulletin says Pendergrass it is actually Pendergraft apologies and we'll correct that so Please uh, make plans for that Sunday, 2 to 4, uh, Holly Robinson, soon to be Holly Pendergraft. So, again, sorry for that. Teen girls, don't forget your uh, Devo tonight right after uh, services. Puppet practice, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Uh, each of those individually will have puppet practice tonight, 9, 10, and then 11 and 12. So make, make plans for that. Again, March 26th for the men's breakfast. The sign-up sheet is out, I believe, and ready to, uh, for if you're interested, you can sign up. I'll make this announcement again Wednesday, but don't forget daylight savings time is coming up this coming uh, Saturday before you, you go to bed. Be sure to set your clocks forward, spring forward uh, one hour. Ushers, if you'll uh, pick up any, any visitor's cards, please. Our first song is going to be song number 394, song number 394. Our opening prayer will be by Brother Steve Harless. Our closing prayer by Brother Jackson Richard. And Chip Broad is going to have our, our scripture reading. If you would, open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, verses 10 through 20, starting with verse 10, going through 20, and be reading from the New King James Version. Again, that's uh, Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer, as supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this evening and the opportunity we have to be here together, study from your word, and sing songs of praise, and listen to a lesson. Father, we pray for those that are not here this evening, that are sick, uh, those in our number that we know of, like Lois Webster and Brother Emmett as they recover, and, and others, Father, that are sick and uh, that we may not know of. We pray for them to have full recovery so they can be back with us. Father, we also pray for those that uh, are spiritually sick, that have not been in attendance. We pray that uh, we'll see opportunities to encourage them, 
to be back with us. And we pray that uh, you'll be with them and, and encourage them also. Father, we're thankful for the teachers that we have here at Maysville. We know that uh, the work that goes into teaching week to week, and uh, we pray that they'll not go, grow weary. We're especially thankful for the teachers of our little ones that teach them the principles of your son at an early age that they can carry with them the rest of their life. Father, we pray that we, we understand the, the responsibility we have there. Father, we... Uh, Pray for those in the mission field also that are out teaching um, around the world. We know that, uh, that sometimes there are things that they struggle with. And, and Father, we pray that they're, for their success uh, in reaching souls and that souls will be brought to Christ and that you will remove every hindrance from their work. And Father, we're, we ask that you give us an opportunity to uh, teach others as we go out into our own personal mission field that we will look for opportunities to be good examples, uh, to share the, the great story of your son and his death and the, the good news that we can have salvation and eternal life. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness, what a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all path grows from day to day leaning on <laughs> sting arms leaning leaning safe and secure from all alarms leaning 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 on the everlasting arms. Very good. Number 841. 841. <clears throat> Be the first and the last, please. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and... <coughs> All the whole day through, there's a silver line that shines in the heavenly line. Look by faith and say, my friend, trust in his promises, grind. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you here will keep your soul at all. Be faithful, look. To him and pray, lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Off we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust me stay, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. 943, 943. 
<clears throat> we'll sing this through a couple of times. <clears throat> I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to Six hundred eighty-two. Six hundred eighty-two. Seven hundred forty five. 
first and the last. Living below in this old sinful world, and hardly comfort can afford, striving alone to face temptation sore. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand with friends I love so near. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a Needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Number 520. How about marking that as our song of invitation? 520. And now number 71, number 71. <clears throat> if you'd like to, please stand. We'll sing a couple of stanzas of this. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Be seated, please. Let me encourage you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, we'll begin reading in just a moment with verse 14. Just like the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15 has three stories about the lost in parable form. So Matthew chapter 25 has three lessons from Jesus in parables that are about the topic of judgment, or at least life and judgment. The first is about preparedness. We often speak of it as the, um, the wise and foolish virgins because there are a group of each listed there. The third parable here, uh, beginning in verse 31 and going through the end of the chapter, um, usually does not have a name, but it is descriptive of the judgment scene where Jesus uh, divides those on the right and the left, and they are judged in according to how we have treated other people. And that leaves the second one. The second parable in the middle, beginning in the 14th verse and going down through verse 30, 
is often described by us as the parable of the talents. What's it about? Let's read together and then spend some time discussing this interesting parable. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, look, oh, excuse me, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." I want for us this evening to examine this discussion, looking at the various pieces and then put them together. Let's begin, number one, with the element of money. It is unfortunate that the translation of the word here, that is the Greek word, talenton, is, becomes an English word, talent. It's unfortunate because the word talent in our language in English means one's ability. But that's not what the word is. The Greek word here is a measure of money. Actually, it is a weight. It is a weight of gold or silver. A talent was a certain amount of something. And it would be far more uh, appropriate for us when looking at this story to use a different kind of nomenclature uh, completely. And if you'll pardon me tonight, I'm going to modify it a little bit. Imagine that a talent, it's, it's not the case, but just work with me here, was equal to 20 pounds. And we're going to make the, the currency involved here gold. So the one who was given five of those, five times 20 pounds, he got 100 pounds of gold. This belonged to the master, and his job was to take care of it. The one who got two talents, 20 times two, we like to call 40 pounds. He got 40 pounds of gold to work with. And then there was one, so he got 20 pounds. So if we look at this from a, uh, an equivalent standpoint, we have a man that was given 100 pounds of gold, assuming my uh, already given uh, modifications, 100 pounds of gold, 40 pounds of gold, and 10 pounds or 20 pounds of gold, respectively. And they were supposed to use this, that which would belong to the master. 
He could not go off and travel carrying all of this with him. So it was appropriate for him to leave this behind with his servants for them to be involved in doing what they were going to do. That's element number one, the object given to them. Element number two is work. What these men were expected to do was get involved in doing something with that money or that wealth. Their job was not to sit on it like a chicken on an egg. Their job was to use it in commerce, to go out and do something. They traded, they bought and sold. It says, verse 16, he traded with them and made another five. So what was going on here is that this man, using this money now, gets involved in the work of commerce and gains more money for his master. I don't know what kind of television you watch, but there's lots of business-type shows on TV. Um, there used to be one. It may still be running. I only say it because I haven't run across it in a while. used to be a show where they were uh, fixing up old houses, and it was being done for a profit. This wasn't being done just for the fun of it. And so the whole storyline across the 30 minutes or the hour, whatever it would be, would be they would show this old house and they would purchase it. They'd tell you how much money they bought it for. And they might, you know, depending on where it was and what the property was, uh, buy a house for $70,000 or eighty or ninety or 100000 or sometimes more expensive than that. I saw a show where they were uh, picking a property down in Florida, and they started out with $130,000. I looked at the old piece of property. They showed the pictures of it, and I said, you got to be kidding. They'll never make any money off of that. So they make their purchase, and then they start working on it. They tear stuff out. They remodel kitchens. They remodel bathrooms. They tear out the floors. They redo the outside, the inside, the yards. And then they'll tell you, here's what our budget is. This is the amount of money we hope to spend on it. This is what we've done. Here's what our purchase price was. Now we've invested another 20, 30, 50, 40, whatever thousand dollars. And after we get it all fixed up, now we're going to put it on the market. And we want to make a profit from it so that we add up our original purchase price plus whatever materials and labors cost into it. And now we've added that together to come up with a nice profit. And we're hoping to make thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in profit or whatever. And then it sells or not. There's shows where uh, one of the ones that pops up on the uh, History Channel is Pawn Stars. P-A-W-N, pawn. Make sure you understand that good. And it's a pawn store. It's a pawn shop. And so they buy and sell stuff. And so people come and bring them things. And uh, quite often it will be an object where the individual who's uh, running the store does not know exactly what it's worth. And they may call in an expert. And he may value something at five or six or $8,000 and said, okay, well, how, do, how much do you want for it? And inevitably, the person making the sale will say, well, I want five, six, eight thousand dollars $8,000, whatever the expert said it's worth. And he'll say, no, that's not what I'll be able to sell it for. I'll give you $2,000 for it. I'm going to sell it for three or $4,000 so that I can make some money on it. Maybe you've seen another one that's... Uh, it's called American Pickers, where they go out and they're looking through barns and old people's stuff. And sometimes it's just old junk, but they'll find old signs and pots and pans and whatever, motorcycles and bicycles. And, and uh, they'll, they'll argue with the folks, yeah, I'll give you $25, $50, whatever. And in the show, what they always show, picked for, and they'll give you the price, valued at, they'll tell you how much they expect to sell it for, and the profit. What was taking place here was about using the money. These guys were not bankers. They were supposed to be workers. It was their job to get out and get involved in commerce. Now the thing is, you can't get involved in commerce unless you've already got money. The master provided the seed money. He says, here's what you're going to work with. This is your capital to use. Now go out and use it. Number one and number two, they did great. They took their money, they went out, 
They bought. They sold. They made a difference. But not number three. Number three dug a hole in the ground and put the master's money in the hole and covered it up and didn't do a thing with it. Element number three in our lesson is time. Verse 19, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Now, there are lots of concepts or ideas that I'm not going to include in our discussion tonight. Not because they're not important, but because it's just not going to go with the flow of, of uh, where we're describing our discussion here. He was gone a long time. How long's a long time? Well, it would be suitable for the discussion of the parable to talk about 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever. But it seems pretty clear from the purpose of Jesus using the analogy in the setting that he does that it's a lifetime. That the master allows these servants to use their time and all of the time that they've got and then he comes back and gives them account. The two other parables that, uh, are, that are around this, the story of the, uh, the young virgins uh, waiting for the bridegroom and then the story at the end are obviously set to come to judgment. Number three leaves no doubt whatsoever. The Lord will divide in the judgment day and will, they will give an account concerning what they have done with their time. And so this time factor has become in. The, the time of life has now been used. What have you done with the money that you've been given? What work have you accomplished in the time that you've been allotted? So there is a product, a material wealth. There's an opportunity to do something with it, and the time factor allows them an opportunity to serve. There are several parables where the element of time specifically comes in and, and marks an uncertainty. My Bible naturally opens up in Matthew chapter 25 where I can also see into chapter 24 and we're going to read there in a moment but just back up a verse beyond what we started with. Look at verse 13 of, verse, of chapter 25. Watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour as the Son of Man is coming. Back over Chapter uh, 24, beginning in verse 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an, at an hour you do not expect. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delayed in his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him to come, and an hour when he is not aware of, and will cut him in two, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth." It's clear that in the element of time, one of the things that Jesus is bringing in here is you don't know when the day of accounting is coming. If you knew when it was coming, you might act differently. Maybe we would hedge our bets a little bit. Maybe you could slide a little while because you knew that the end, you'd have time to make it up. But that's not the story. The master goes away. The servants don't know when he's going to return. But when the Lord does return, there's going to be an accounting for what has taken place. The time is there, but it's uncertain. Element number five is, I guess it's number four. Don't, don't get ahead of myself. Element number four is profit. We may not talk about profit very often. 
And I don't know that uh, most of the time in looking at this parable, the concept of profit per se comes up, but if you spend a little time looking at it, it's awfully hard to miss the imagery that Jesus is describing here of profit. Now, the concept of profit is fairly simple. If you pay $40 for something and then you sell it for $80, you have made a $40 profit. You buy low, you sell high, the difference is profit. Or, if you're involved with goods and services, let's imagine perhaps that you are uh, building furniture. Um, and you might buy wood and nails and varnish and other materials that are required to build a piece. And uh, you take your time, your labor, your skills, and you plane that wood. You saw it into appropriate dimensions. You fashion it properly. You sand it, finish it, stain it, get it all ready to sell. And you might sell that piece for $500. Well, that's a $400 profit. That is the value of your labor. The profit is the concept of you took something that had a certain value and what you did to it, added to it, raised it up, and now it is more valuable than when you got it. Now there is no way to miss in this parable the illustration that Jesus was teaching that God expects a profit from his workers. Now that's not always something that we stress, but it's clearly taught in this passage. I know perhaps if you're in, this is, this is not intended to be insulting, if you're in government work, your job may not actually be about a profit. If you're in uh, nonprofit work, your job may not be about a profit. But if you are in a commercial enterprise, if you are working for a private group where they are selling a product or they are selling a service, I guarantee you that someone in a responsible position is looking at your effort and they are determining whether or not your individual effort is profitable to that company. Now, you may not have a, a, a discussion of that, but that's the way it is. And if an owner of a small business, he knows the imagery that's described here is here's a man who has three servants. Now, let's get back to something we haven't talked about yet. How did the master determine who was going to get the money? Verse 15. The master, before he left, he gave the money to each of them according to his own ability and went into a, or went to take a journey. Now that's sometimes where we get crossed over with the word talents again, and that, that's where some of the confusion takes place. It's clear that the master recognized that all of the people were not equal in their abilities to take care of work. They weren't all as profitable as others. Parents are not supposed to have favorites, right? At least that's what I've heard. But I've heard people talk about their kids. Several years ago, I was at a family reunion, and I don't remember how the conversation came up, but before long, the conversation was talking about kids and what they were doing, and this one and that one. And uh, one of the individuals who was describing began talking about some of the stuff their kids were involved in. One of them had gone to school and had put in X amount of years in service and had gone on to get that award and gone on to get this award and was now working at a very uh, involved firm and uh, obviously uh, producing well and being well paid for it. There was another one of the kids, as the parent was describing for them, and they said, you know, they, they struggled in school. They really just didn't feel like they had a, a good direction in life and decided not to go into college, got into a very low-paying, low-skilled position, and they were, you know, just kind of struggling along. Now, if you are a business owner, if you're a manager, 
and you are responsible for the people who work under you, you know what kind of folks they are. You know that if you've got a job to be done, if you really need it to be done, you don't give it to them because they either won't do it or they won't do it on time or you won't be certain that it'll be done right. You may have to follow up with it. But if you really, really want it done, you give it to this person because you know they'll do it. They'll do it right. They'll do it on time. Right? And sometimes that's true even in families. How does God see us? It's clear in the principle being taught here in the parable that there was a recognition that some folks were more diligent than others. There were some who would work and some who wouldn't. That leads us to element number five. Judgment day and the day of reckoning. You go back and you see the, uh, the time for the accounting. Verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. Can you see his chest popped out? Can you see his smile on his face and him beaming ear to ear? Look what I've done. I have I've met my challenge. I've done what I was supposed to do. I'm ready. The one who'd received the 40 pounds, two talents. He said, you gave me this, I've doubled it. Look what I've done. But not the third. The third did not come and do that. He doesn't bring a profit report. He doesn't bring a statement of earnings. He doesn't tell about all the good things that uh, he's done. Instead, he chooses to attack the master. Instead of telling the master the good work that he's done, he instead begins to impugn the character of the master. He said, I, I know you're a hard man. I knew you were a hard man. What? What? Hard man. What does it mean you're a hard man? Does hard man mean that you're looking for opportunities? He says, I know you reap where you don't sow. Okay. Many years ago, while one of my youngsters was involved in the beginnings of the job business, they... Uh, we're looking for a job, and I made a couple of suggestions along the way. Most of them were met with, no, no, that, Dad, I don't want to work there. Whatever. But I can recall at least one occasion where I suggested a, a business that they might go and talk to about working for this uh, individual. And uh, the response was, I don't want to work for them. I've heard they're hard. What does that mean? Mean? Demanding? If you raise children and you force them to work, it may be that your children will call you mean. If you have expectations of them and require that they do certain things. But he goes on. He said, I heard, I know that you're a hard man, that you reap where you did not sow. Second, he offers an excuse. He said, so I was afraid. I was afraid of you. You intimidated me. And because you intimidated me, then number three, my third excuse, I went and I dug in the ground and I put it there. And here, you can have it back and you should be happy with it. Imagine a farmer. Oh, better yet, imagine you're a farmer. Imagine you're a farmer and you are farming whatever product you'd like. Let's say you're farming cotton. 
How are you going to go about farming that cotton? Well, at the proper time of year, you're going to come and you're going to till the soil and you are going to come and you're going to either fertilize it or weed it or whatever you need to do and you're going to plant that crop and then you're going to wait and you're going to wait for the rain to come and for the sunshine to come and you're going to wait for the appropriate amount of time and at the proper time, you're going to see the plants come up and you're going to deal with the crop how you need to and then finally you're going to get to harvest it. All right. But let's say you're a farmer and you're planting cotton and you say, well, you know, we could have a hailstorm in the middle of the summertime and it could knock out my entire crop. I could end up with nothing if we get hailed on. I don't think I'm going to plant. Or you may be in the spring and you say, you know, if those boll weevils get out in my field, they could, they could ruin me. And I really don't have the equipment and the, uh, the money to go and spray. And I tell you what, I'm afraid of those insects, so maybe, maybe I just won't plant this year. What would you say to a farmer who made those kind of suggestions or those kind of excuses? You'd say, buddy, you got no business being in farming. You're not a farmer. That's not what farmers do. Farmers farm. They plant a crop and then they deal with whatever comes. You can't predict the weather. You don't know what's going to take place. And if you choose not to go forward because of you're, you're afraid that it might hail on your crop or you might not get the rain at the proper time or you might get uh, insects in it and destroy it, you are never going to have a crop. And people who live in fear who say, well, you know, I'm not going to do that because of, of whatever. And they don't accomplish anything. And they don't go anywhere. This man said, I was afraid, and so I dug in the ground and I buried it, and, and, and look, you've got it all. Imagine if you gave $10,000 to an investment banker, and you said, you've got 10 years to make a profit out of this. I'm going to give you this money for 10 years. You make it grow. You come to the end of your 10 years, and you go have a meeting with your investment banker, and your investment banker hands you a check for $10,000, says, here's your check back. What would you say to him? You'd say, you've got to be kidding me. I gave you this money for 10 years and you did nothing with it? Well, you know, I was afraid, you know, markets go up and down. You know, sometimes the stock market's not a very safe place to be. So rather than take a chance on losing your money, I just decided I'd keep it safe. And so I've, I've kept your check all these years right there in that drawer. And here, here it is. There you go. Would you take that money back with a smile? I don't think so. You'd be upset. You'd be angry. You'd say, you didn't even put it in the bank? You could have put it in the bank and gotten 3% interest on it for crying out loud. You didn't even put it in the bank? You just held it there in your drawer? And so here's Jesus. He makes the pronouncements. When the first two servants gave their prophet report he said well done good and faithful servant the word good here does not mean morally good it means useful the word faithful does not mean they've been morally right it means they've done what they've been charged to do if you've got a good hammer that doesn't mean that it doesn't go out and rob and steal it means that it functions as the tool ought to ought to perform it does the job of a hammer I've had some screwdrivers that were bad screwdrivers. How can you have a bad screwdriver? They, they sleep, sleep out, or they sneak out at night and stay out late and get drunk? No, if you've ever had a, some of you guys have had bad screwdrivers, haven't you? That were too soft, they didn't have enough uh, strength in the material, and you get on something where you're trying to pry against it instead of taking out the fastener or whatever is the, the, the the, uh, the bit just twists, it'll bend, or the ears will break off. It's a bad tool. But he says, you good, faithful, you, you, are, you did what you were supposed to do, you were useful, you were faithful in what you were doing. And then the contrast to that. Verse 26, the Lord said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. The concept of wicked here does not mean that he was evil that he was immoral, but rather, you were a bad servant. You were bad because you were useless. There was a, uh, something you needed to do, you didn't do it. Not only did you not do it, you were lazy. You wicked 
and lazy servant. I'd love to spend a few minutes talking about lazy. I'll only say this. There's probably nobody in this room that would use the word lazy in a good way. And you do not want to hear from God to be called a lazy servant. What was his real problem? What was the problem with this guy? Why did he not do what he should do? And we know what his excuses were. He said, I was afraid of you. I was afraid you were a hard man, so I wouldn't hid this stuff in the ground. The real problem with this servant was how he viewed the master. He didn't respect him. He didn't honor him. And he wasn't interested in doing good for him. I don't know, and, and I've, it would be inappropriate perhaps for me to say what might have been the case, but imagine, if you will, if the servant had, uh, had taken his, uh, if we use his 20 pounds of gold, if he'd taken his 20 pounds of gold and he'd gone out and got in the business world and he had bought and sold, and what if the story says he took his, his money, he went and bought and sold, but he wasn't a very good businessman and he lost his money. It didn't work out. At least then he could have gone back to the master and he, he could have said, well, here's what happened. I went out, I took the money, I made some purchases, I tried to get involved in business, they did not work out, and I lost it. What would the answer then be? Well, you might have said, well, you know, you're not very good at making choices, and maybe we don't want to give you any more money. But he wouldn't have called him a wicked and lazy servant. He might have said, you need some more education. Or maybe we need to train you on how to make better business decisions. But that's not what happened. He said, you did nothing. You didn't try. There were a couple of times when my children told me that they thought I was mean because I made them work. Truth of the matter is, I made them work for their own benefit. It was easier, usually, to do the jobs that they were assigned. And uh, one youngster, uh, at a certain point, announced that I sure would be sorry when they left home because all of the work that they did, I'd have to do myself. I held my tongue. But I can tell you now what my thoughts were. I was thinking it would be a lot easier for me to do those jobs than to come behind you and do it better. I enjoy doing those works. The things that I was asking them to do were not punishments. They were works that I did gladly. I enjoyed mowing the yard. I enjoyed washing a truck. I enjoyed taking care of the cleaning of a garage and the other things to take care of of a, a proper property. Those were pleasant to me. They were not punishment. And the Lord is not punishing us by expecting us to do things with our lives and calling on us to live in certain ways and get involved with life. God expects to see a prophet. If we're going to make an application from this text, it's got to be, as we compare our lives, that God has given us gifts. God has put things in our control. Money, stewardship of other things. God has given us time in which to work. God expects us to use it, and I'm going to say it, and God expects to draw a profit from your labor and from my labor, or else this passage doesn't mean anything. God expects us to do something, not just show up and be neutral. Be neutral is dig a hole and stick it in the ground and say to the Lord, well, there it is. And I don't think that's going to work. Do you? What does God expect of us? A couple of readings as we conclude our thoughts. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4.
Verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul said God had a purpose. He put us here and he put people in these positions to work. And he expected those people to build up the body, to build up the church, and to create an environment that was successful. Book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 12. Hebrews 5, 12, following. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I don't want to push this too far because one of our summer series topics is going to be along this line. But how are you going to give an account to God in the judgment day and say, how many years did you sit in Bible class? 30 years, Lord, I was there every service. You sat in Bible class for 30 years? What did you do with that knowledge? Well, I listened. What else did you do with it? Oh, uh, what do you mean? Well, did you take it and teach anyone? Did you do anything with it that was profitable for me? Or did you just soak it up? The walls could do that. When you ought to be teachers, how long should it take to become a teacher? What, how much information should you have? We sometimes talk about people who are professional students. If a person gets out of high school and he goes off to college and he spends four or five years in college on mom and daddy's money, and comes out with a degree, and they decide they want to get another degree. And they go for another four or five years on mom and daddy's money, and they come out with another degree, and then they decide, well, you know, I really don't have a job yet, so I think I'll go get another degree. Sooner or later, it ought to be the role of the parent to say, no, wait a minute, exactly what do you intend to do with this? Education is not about having a good time at a school. Education is about drawing in material and information so that you will be productive to do something. What's the purpose of the Bible class program at church? What's the purpose of our preaching and teaching? If all it is is to just keep us going year after year and it doesn't actually accomplish anything, then I'm going to suggest that we don't have a very profitable system working. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. One of the reasons why we're going to do what we do is so that people can see us doing and God gets the glory from it. God profits from our efforts. Now my time's gone plus. Money, work, time, profit, judgment. There's a lot more in that text. What has God given to you? I've got a more difficult question to answer or to ask. What have you profited him? If God looked at you with a balance sheet and says, here's what I invested in you. Here's the time you had to serve. What is it that you did with all of this? What would your answer be? Watch, for you know not when the Lord will come. We have an opportunity, as long as we live in this life, to take the goods that God has given us, whatever they are, and use them for the service and the glory of God. And if we are not using them, if we are not serving God to His glory, if we are not profiting Him, 
in his kingdom, then should we expect anything other than you wicked and lazy servant? I know that's not what we want to hear. The lesson is here. Jesus said over and over, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I hope we hear the message of this, of this parable. Sobering thoughts. Tonight, what's your relationship with Christ? Is it as a faithful servant of God? Or are there changes you need to make in your life? If you're not a Christian, you need to become a child of God. He'll forgive you of your sins. Based on your repentance and confession, you can become a child of God tonight. Baptized into the body of Christ, you can put on your Lord in baptism and be added to His body. If you're a child of God and not serving as you need, there are other needs in your life you need to respond to publicly. We invite you to come as we stand and sing. Won't you come? Hark and the loving call obey. Come for ye loves you so. Only a step, only a step. Come for ye bled for you and I. He's the same love. Jesus, I crucify, casting your heavy burden down, come to the cross, the world may frown, yet you shall wear a glorious crown, when he makes up his own. Only a step, only a step, come for he bled for you and died. He's the same love. If you yet, Jesus, the crucified. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> Closing song tonight will be 791, 791. We have the Lord's Supper still prepared for you this evening. If you desire it, we'll ask you now to be excused as the foyer. You'll be shown where you can be served. <clears throat> Let's do the first and the second stanza of this before our closing prayer. <clears throat> Hear the voice of Jesus saying, loudly crying unto all, In my vineyard work today, hearken to his call. Work then for Jesus, he will own and bless your labor's work. Work for Jesus, work, work today. Why he asked through all the day, stand ye idle, nothing do. Enter and without delay, I have work for you. Work then for Jesus, he will own and bless your labor's work. Work for Jesus, work, work today. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to come here unpersecuted and worship you, Lord. Thank you for your son dying on the cross so we can have a chance to live in heaven with you. Thank you for all the other unseen beauties of this world that you've given us. And in Christ's name, amen.